Welcome to Global Perspectives. Why are we still talking about slavery in the 21st century? For answers, we turn to Dr. Kevin Bales, Professor of Contemporary Slavery at the University of Nottingham. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Kevin. John, great to be here again. Let's go back to the beginning. Slavery has been an institution for a long time. It's one of the oldest practices of organized human society. What is it that predisposes some people to think that that's okay, and why is it still considered okay by some today? You know, that's an unanswerable question for which I think we can put together a lot of different answers. You, if you go back to the very beginning of human history, you actually discover that slavery itself ha is prehistoric. So we have no clue how it actually began as part of human activity, human culture. I've got a couple of theories of my own. You know, one of them is about that formation of early hunter-gatherer bands and how there would have been a lot of orphan children and orphan children would be taken into other groups and they might be used a kind of familial model of taking people to use their effort and use their, their work. Uh, but it's also true that as soon as you get into the written human history, but even of ancient Samaria 5,000 years ago, you begin to see what there could be, a you could call a, a livestock model. So you see people referred to as livestock. Or you have someone like Aristotle who says the, the ox is the poor man's slave, differentiating the idea between a dumb animal and a very useful human being who can't pull a thousand pounds but can do the same repetitive tasks over and over on, on, in that way. Sadly, I think right from the beginning of the history, and, and again, when we go back and read ancient Babylonian documents, for example, you see that the othering of people is very crucial to why they would be enslavable. So some of the earliest words written down that, are, that, are for, that in a sense denote the concept of slavery aren't slave. There's things like person from the mountains. So I went and I got 12 people from the mountains, and now I have them all working for us and under our control, like cattle. And they'll use that kind of phrase. So there's an interesting sort of livestock animal husbandry, and then also the sense of creating property of people. Okay, and, and, and I think that makes sense. But what about today, when we are presumably better educated, more aware, uh, none of us wants to be enslaved. Uh, it makes us angry to think that anyone would want to do that, but, but then there are people who think that it's okay. And we now have what has been called the largest population in forced servitude in the history of the world. Is, 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 and relative to the overall population of the world, it may be small, but that to me is not the important point. Mm. The point is that it's a huge and growing number. Why is that happening? Well, two or three questions you just asked me in a row. But you know, one of the things about the reason why people enslave each other, you can still bring in the, those earliest forms as well. So you take a, a group like ISIS, who actually publish in their magazine rationalizations, justifications about why it's okay according to the Koran to enslave certain groups of people. They other them. They create the, this idea that they are in a sense below human. Now we have all kinds of different ways of doing that and it could be based on gender or race or politics or religion and so forth. So you have that and then you begin to look at other forms of vulnerability to enslavement across countries and you see that indeed uh, discrimination, prejudice and so forth can, can make that possibility more likely and then you bring in the power differentials and it begins to make it pretty easy to do so. But it's also, I have to say, um, no single thematic approach. You know, people are diverse and they're tricky and they're, and they're all jockeying for different positions within different cultural and economic contexts. And it means that on one place, people became, become something just uh, like a, uh, uh, livestock that can be captured in conflict because we have that. We have people in wars, civil wars especially, who are being captured and then used and then sold and so forth. But then we also have subtle, very subtle psychological manipulation of people in rich countries like the United States where people are lured into a situation, they're in a sense degraded psychologically, torture or psychological abuse can be brought to bear on it. So. You know, it, it's one of those things that's a bit like drama, right? There are a million stories to be told about the nature of power between human beings, and millions of them today concern slavery. 
So this whole question of determining the slave population, if you will, uh, we've seen numbers that range from 25, 27 million up to 50 million, and you have a lot of discussion as to how we arrive at those statistics, which are right, which are wrong, which are conservative, which are, are liberal. Do you have a number? And I know you're actively involved in scientific efforts to measure the extent of slavery. Well, I do have a number, but I have to say it's not my number anymore. It's it's our number. Uh, we, we, you know, the in, last September at the United Nations General Assembly, the ILO, the International Organization for Migration, the Walk Free Foundation, the Rights Lab, my own institution, we all worked together for more than two years to arrive at a single global number and stop having competing numbers. So we brought our statistical teams together, we, we agreed a common methodology, we took that out to academics and scientists and had that undergo peer review. So the good news is these days, we're, we're, we don't have all those numbers and we don't have to worry about is it one or the other because we are all arrived at and agreed upon the idea that there are at this moment 40.3 million people, our best estimate, in slavery at any one moment and then we also, for the first time, were able to introduce the idea of a flow number. That is, how many people would pass through the state of enslavement over, say, the last five-year period. And we put that at just over 89 million people. So we have a stock of 40.3 and a flow of about 89 over a five-year period. Now, that's been very exciting to arrive at that kind of unity. Uh, it was a challenge because uh, the international organizations like the UN don't practice data transparency, which is which is required of all academic scientific approach. I mean, you know, if you're doing cancer research, you you obviously always publish your data because it's very important to share with other researchers. So, how are you actively involved in measurement now? Are there some specific projects you can talk about where you're trying to determine the extent of? of well, compared to when I started measuring it back in the late 90s and ended up with a number of 27 million. That was with a, a group of students who collected data and it was all secondary sources. A lot of it was news reports. I couldn't vouch for the reliability of, of those numbers and of those reports that we gathered together. And when I first published that, that number, I, I put a big disclaimer on it and said, you know, there's no way I can be absolutely certain about any of this. But since then, and particularly for the last about six years, we've had significant financial support, particularly from the Walk Free Foundation, which has paid for a couple of three things. One is a very large access to the Gallup World Poll. Now, the Gallup organization is one of the great opinion but survey organizations in the world. They carry out surveys in every single country they can get into, which is more than 180, I think. Uh, and we now use the Gallup World Poll in those countries where random sample surveys will actually tell us something about the extent, the prevalence of slavery. You don't go around asking people, are you a slave? But you say to each household that you visit, has anything like this happened to anyone in your extended family? And then it begins to give you a network of those. Then we were also able to invest very significantly in our statistical power and our are great methodologists. And then we're able to build on the random sample surveys to do, it's, it starts to get nerdy at this point, John, I'll warn you, extrapolation algorithms that help us to project to other countries where we are not able to do the surveys yet. And then on top of that, we've brought in a new technique called multiple systems estimation, which works in those countries where surveys don't, the rich countries. The rich countries have so little slavery in terms of their, the, their overall population that you can't get a net fine enough to find the examples. It's better hidden in rich countries. But you can use this multiple systems estimation to determine that. And we pioneered that in, in, in Great Britain in 2015, published a result that, su that was surprising to a lot of people, but actually led to an immediate change in government policy because they said we finally have an idea of the true number of people enslaved in Great Britain and that really helped them to set policy. Was it close to the number that people thought it was or was it? The situation was that there, there were about 2,700 cases that were known 
in the, in, that, in the year that we did the research. So in the whole process of the entire government, and you know, in, in, in Great Britain with a centralized government, you can bring those data together more easily. But there are about 2,700 known cases. But using multiple systems estimation, which allows you to extrapolate out to the, what we call statistically the universe, but basically the total number for the country, it suggested that between 10 and 13,000 people were in slavery in that time period. Now, some people had been guessing high and some people had been guessing low, but it was all guesses. And now we actually have a, a, a number that, that the government statisticians and the Home Office and the other crime agencies and so forth consider to be reliable. And now we're beginning to dig more deeply and say, now, if we have 13,000 or so in the, in the Great Britain, how are they distributed? Let's, let's begin to do this at local levels as well. Does having that number make it more likely that you'll be able to mobilize resources and public support, et cetera, et cetera? It, it absolutely does, because I've been in those situations in the U.S. Congress. When I've been along to talk to a senator and you say, this is a very serious problem, uh, we really need to increase the resources because it's, it's underfunded and we need training for border patrol, whatever. And, I've, and senators have looked me right in the eye and said, um, but I see that we've only had 812 cases and you're telling me this is a multi-million dollar problem. Now, how do I reconcile the, the cases that I know about with this idea that sounds a bit sensational, excuse me, but you know, sensational when you're telling me it's a multi-million dollar problem. When we have a notion, uh, a good solid estimate of what the true number is in any place, it allows policymakers to do what they need to do, which is to base their planning on the solid foundation of a, of a real number. So moving into the discussion of the people who are affected by this in the United States since we're here and we're talking about a population that includes individuals who are brought in for slavery purposes from a number of countries, but also American citizens mm. who are trafficked around, around the country, uh, what are the kinds of things we're doing for them, especially as they are rescued from their slavery situations? And what, what else should we be doing? Well. I have to say what we are doing is reactive. It happens when people are suddenly found for a great many situations. It's piecemeal. There is very little uniform approach. Uh, and it's sometimes uh, highly temporary in the sense that funding comes and goes. It's, it's seen as a charitable activity. So you know, if we were talking about, <laughs> imagine a world in, in the United States where you, if, if cancer was the, was the issue, and you said, well, we may or may not have a hospital bed because you know, it's all charitably funded, and, um, and you, know, you really do need to make sure you've got it before you come in, but we can't afford to check you to see if you have it. You know, this would be the situation, this is the situation that we have with people who are in contemporary slavery in the United States. We know where we need to go. We need to have standardization of, of provisions for them. We know how to help people. We know that they need educational support. They need uh, psychological counseling. They need a good physical um, checkup when, they, when they've come out because there is a, a lot of health impact of uh, being enslaved, as you can imagine. We know that you need to work with people to say, not how do we support you forever, but how do we help you to become the person you want to be because after all, a person who's been enslaved is just someone who's had their life and work stolen from them. But it doesn't mean that they, they are without life and they are without the capacity to work. And most of the survivors will tell you, you know, I don't, I don't want to live my life as a victim who's constantly being supported. I want to just have an opportunity to open the door to finish my education or to get some job training and so forth. In the United States, we have some good provisions for people who have come out of trafficking and slavery. But I have to say it's not uniform and it's not coherent. We have a G GI Bill that helps veterans come into education. It, it wouldn't be a big stretch to say for the very much smaller number of people who are coming out of slavery, let's have a, let's have a survivor's bill to help them go into education and rebuild their lives. I was actually thinking about education and the unique role that colleges and universities in particular have in terms of informing and developing awareness and training and, and working with the, the survivors of human trafficking. How is that process going? How, how is it evolving in the United States based on your experience? And as a follow-up, what, what can colleges and universities do that are committed to this issue mm. 
uh, should it be very, very laser focused or should it be comprehensive? Well, what's going on now is vastly improved over, say, 10 years ago. You have a lot of awareness on campuses. You have a lot of awareness among universities. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to the president of Vassar College, and we were discussing uh, with a student group how we might help Vassar College become the first college in America to declare itself slavery free and what that would mean, for example, to say uh, enough already with just uh, fairly sensational public awareness. Uh, let's talk about what you actively do to turn your college or university into a place where slavery is never going to exist or never be supported by. So that's one way to say in the same way that we talk about slave free communities, to talk about slave free universities. But the other thing is that the universities what they do best is think, plan, analyze, research, and this is a field that's wide open. We know, for example, very little about the mental health needs of people who are surviving in slavery. We don't, we, there's never been MRI research on the, on the impact of brain physiology or the, or the epigenetics of people who have gone through slavery. We don't know what are, there is no common, uh, commonly agreed rehabilitation protocol for people who have come out of slavery in a way that you have it for football players who have suffered brain injuries and so forth. I mean, there, in a sense, we're, we're at this point where the foundations are beginning to form around what we must do to work to ultimately 40 million people. And then we also have to be thinking, as we did just a second ago, talk about if you're going to have that many people come to freedom, we have to figure out how to make that freedom possible and fulfilling for them. We don't want to do what happened in the United States in 1865. You know, four million people lifted up out of slavery and then dumped, no access to credit, education, political participation, suffering discrimination and prejudice. We're still paying the price for a botched emancipation in 1865. Let's get this emancipation right, and make it the one that, that really works. So where should a, a college or university start? Let's assume that it has an interest, uh, it understands the, the problem of human trafficking internationally, nationally, and regionally. What, what should it do? Should it, um, again, focus on one of these areas you've mentioned, or should it try to engage comprehensively? Well, I, I think the answer is really all of the above, but absolutely focus on one area if the university college has an areas of expertise. You know, so some schools have big mental health installations, others work in economic development, some may work in job training, some may work in law enforcement. You know, all of those could say, wait, let's make sure we see this work through a slavery lens, just as the USAID looks at their projects through a slavery lens before they grant money to say, let's bring the skills that we already have to bear. We don't have to reinvent wheels. Let's bring the skills we already have to bear and adapt them to, to this particular approach. Then I say it's always important, if it's all possible, to understand that when you're looking at scholarship provision and to say, we support a lot of people who have faced significant disadvantage. And that's part of the nature of higher education that, that we're proud of. Let's try to do that with survivors of slavery and make sure that they contribute their voices. Now, it's not easy always because some survivors wouldn't necessarily want to be identified as such. They just want to come as students and move on with their lives. But it's also true that some do and are happy to say to the university community, actually, let me tell you how I as a survivor would like to work with you to go forward with this. And you know, it's also, also uh, possible to say this is, a, this is an area of growth and success for universities. The government uh, in this country, but also international bodies, are looking for solid research capacity to answer all the unanswered questions that we have about modern slavery. And they're willing to pay for it. And that's usually music to the ears of any university administrator. So what are the projects that you're working on right now in addition to measurement. Do you have anything special that you could talk about? That oh, sure. Uh, there are two or three things that, I, that I, I'm particularly excited about. Um, one is that I've assembled a team and we're just reaching out for some funding that we feel fairly confident about. And we will carry out the very first 
uh, MRI, the brain imaging study of people who have been enslaved. So this has been done with Holocaust survivors, it's been done with Romanian orphans, but no one's ever actually looked at the brains of people who have been in slavery for long periods and say, how does slavery affect the brain physiologically and epigenetically? In other words, how does it change your physiology and, and your metabolism afterwards? That's an important thing to do, and we'll do that with a control group, and we'll be able to learn what we can learn. Maybe we, <laughs> there may be nothing there, but even that is an important finding, because all of that then leads to potential therapeutic responses. Another thing that I'm excited about is that, is that we're now able to, to reach into a geospatial institute, which has access to satellite imagery of high quality, uh, constantly being refreshed. And we've been developing new ways to identify potential slavery sites from space. And not just to do that, but to train artificial intelligence through crowdsourcing. So we actually have thousands of people around the, the planet who have helped us to crowdsource the knowledge for the identification of brick kilns in South Asia, for example, which then trains the AI to do the work of finding and, and identifying them. So in a sense, we're opening a, a way of of bringing an eye in the sky to uh, the identification of sites of high likelihood of slavery. Not just brick kilns, but lots of others as well. So those are a couple that I'm excited about. I, I was going to ask you, what, what are the things that they look for to help identify these sites? And you mentioned one. Are there other details, or are those things kept quiet because you don't want <coughs> no, to? No, no, no. We, we can talk about that. I mean, of course, a lot of slavery is, is under a roof, right? And you, you can't tell that. Right, from, from satellite work. But there are a lot of places where slavery is pretty obvious and we know exists in, in high proportion in things like a brick kiln. Now brick kilns in Asia, of which we now know from our research for the first time, no one knew how many brick kilns were in all of South Asia. There's about 300,000 of them. And they're big structures, and they tend to all be in the shape of an oval with a big chimney right in the middle. So it, it really stands out from space. Uh, likewise, the horrific enslavement of children in fish processing camps in the Shunderbund's UNESCO World Heritage Site at the bottom of India and Bangladesh, uh, they stand out like a sore thumb because uh, this is supposed to be a completely untouched mangrove forest. It's very important. It's the largest carbon sink in all of Asia. But you know, when you, when you cut down all the trees and suddenly there's a big square gap in the middle of what's supposed to be an untouched mangrove forest, it's not hard to see from space. And likewise, mining, open cast mining. When people use slaves to mine gold, cassiterite for our phones, molybdenum, whatever, uh, it's done in a medieval way. I mean, there's, there are no bulldozers. Uh, there are no big earth movers. It's, it's people with picks and shovels. And the scar that they leave in the natural world when they do this open cast mining using slave labor because the slaveholders don't care about protecting the environment any more than they care about protecting the people. They, it leaves a big footprint. And we're working all the time trying to find other ways to do that. For example, satellites can actually pre can detect mineral levels from space. The mining companies have invested a lot into this. But one of the things I've discovered is you can see the traces of mercury in water courses from space. Now that sounds a little odd, but slave produced gold generates a significant mercury contamination of the environment where it happens. So another way we'll be able to look for not just the enslavement, but the incredibly damage, incredible environmental damage of mercury poisoning as well. What was the first time you met a person who was enslaved or somebody who had escaped from slavery, and I'm sure you remember that well. I do, I do indeed. I, do, I, I remember it very well. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a young woman, uh, I think she was 19, she thinks, she didn't know her exact age, but it was, in, it was in France. It was actually at a lovely house in rural France, and this young woman had been enslaved as a seven-year-old in Mali but then brought immediately to Paris as a domestic servant. So she had lived from the age of seven to about 19 uh, as a slave in a house, in a fairly well-off Malian household in, in Paris. And she had been sexually assaulted. She had been tortured in horrific ways. She'd done all this work for years. She had no access to education whatsoever. And then she had come to a point of liberation through an organization that I knew well. 
and I would and and they ask if she would have a chat with me and like that. And what I remember so much about it is that I'd been looking and thinking about slavery for several years, and I had come to a whole lot of assumptions, assumptions like. Isn't it must be amazing to come to freedom to be able to make choices and to actually have choices in your life again and how you must see the world if you've been in slavery. And she basically destroyed almost all of my assumptions in our conversations. And I realized that I, that I couldn't imagine the truth of slavery. But when she had described the truth of slavery, not in a sense of let me tell you about slavery, but let me tell you how I see the world, I realized I had to start all over and really listen to people in slavery. One of them was I said, isn't it great that you have choices now? And she said, oh, yeah, it's fine. And I said, oh, no, but I'm talking about all the choices you could, oh, fine, fine. And then I, I said, I don't think you, can we talk about that choice thing? And, and she had warmed to me enough that she said, look, everybody keeps talking to me about choices. They tell me I must like choices. I don't know what these choice things are. No one will show me one of these things. But I know I'm supposed to like them, so I say that I do. And I realized. <laughs> I was approaching this from someone who had grown from infancy and freedom. And once we adjust our minds to, to, our, to the true freedom that we have, it's very hard. You know, it's like, it's like suddenly being in a completely dark room. You can't see. The light's not there anymore. And that was just, that was just the beginning of, a, of a, quite a learning process that, that this woman gave me. Great story. And thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin Bales. It's always great to be here. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.